Uh, hi, folks. A very good evening and thank you for joining in. Uh, could you just confirm in the chat window if I'm visible and audible clearly? We'll get started with the session itself in a few minutes. So I have it on my phone so that I can just check if everything is working as expected. Okay, at least I can see myself on my phone in the feedback loop, so things are looking good at my end. Hey folks, uh, good evening and thank you for joining in. Okay, cool, very good, very good. So it seems everything is uh, working as expected. Uh, we will start the session in a couple of minutes. We'll wait for others to jump in. Uh, today we are starting databases. Uh, I mean, the initial topics of ER models, basics of relational calculus and things like that. Uh, we have about uh, five questions today, as usual, and uh, the earlier ones are surely easier ones. The later ones are a little tricky, medium level and things like that. Cool. Uh, yeah, sounds good. So uh, we'll wait for a couple of minutes for everyone to join in and dive into the session itself uh, at 7 or 2 or so. If you have general questions, uh, feel free to ask me. As usual, we'll spend some time at the end of the session also for general Q&A. Cool, cool. Okay, I have the chat window. So Shubham says, uh, what could be uh, the last six month preparation tips? Very simple, just speed up. Um, um, because uh, as you come closer to the examination, try and spend more time. But realistically speaking, if you put in six, seven months of rigorous effort, you can crack it. It's as simple as that. So my strongest recommendation is start getting serious about it. Because this is the six months that matters more that than the previous six months or even probably the past few years that you've prepared for gate. So a lot of people, the most, a couple of things that I would suggest to you is please don't give up at this point. We see a lot of people who give up in the last six months thinking, hey, I will never get a good rank. No, you've put in some effort or even if you've started right now, six months, if you're dedicated, putting in about four to five hours a day, consistently, you can crack gate. So the most important thing is please don't give up. Please be disciplined with your time get away from social media unless you're learning something from it very importantly fourth just just follow the rest of the guidelines that we typically give in gate prep watch the video solve the problems revise 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 very simple right the, i mean those are the top things that come to my mind uh, when somebody asks me for anything related to six months of uh, last six months of prep okay cool so let me see uh, any other questions that are here So this is, okay, so I can see these comments here also. Uh, okay, uh, this is from Sri who says uh, um, things, are, things, are, things are a little hectic for him because of loss of family members, uh, because of personal crisis and also the gate and placements. So Sri, please, very, very importantly, don't burn out. If you have a family emergency that you have to attend to, that is more important. You can always write gate next year also. Get a placement, get into a job. You can always prepare because if you have a family emergency and you have to attend to the family emergency, you can't do it next year, right? So family certainly at the end of the day is, is one of the top priorities of life. So if you have a family emergency that you have to attend to, it's okay. Um, give your best, get a placement uh, in your final year. I think you're a final year student. So just go with, uh, uh, go, go with, go with the, go with your, placements, continue your gate preparation. If you can do it thoroughly, great, or else just give it a shot this year. You can certainly write gate next year also. The world isn't collapsing, okay? I understand that some of you may have family crises that you have to attend to. We have to prioritize one versus rest. Cool. Uh, so, uh, so, okay. Uh, how is Bits Pilani in terms of campus placements? So, uh, Kushal, uh, my knowledge of BITS is very limited to their undergraduate program. Their undergraduate program has very good placements. I'm not very sure of their MTech program because uh, I've not uh, interviewed or worked with a lot of people uh, who did their MTech from BITS Pilani campus. So I do not know. Uh, you'll have to verify that with respect to the current students or students who have recently graduated. But their undergraduate placements are terrific. They're really, really good. And most of, most of them actually go through internships for about six months, if I'm not wrong. 
because uh, my team had tons of undergrad uh, bits interns uh, when I was at Amazon and many of them convert to full-time roles. Okay, sounds good. So since it's 7.02, let's get started with the questions. I'll come back to the general Q&A later. Okay, so let's start solving the questions because that's what we are all here for. So is my screen visible clearly so that we can get started? Is my screen clear, please? Can you please confirm if my screen is clear? We can get started. Okay, cool. So let's get started then. So today, uh, this is the first live session with respect to databases, often referred to as DBMS. Today, we'll discuss a few questions on ER models, relational models, basic relational algebra. So let's get started with this. We'll start with easy questions as usual, two to three easy questions. Then we'll go into the slightly more tricky ones at the later part. Okay, so I mean, fairly straightforward, easy question at the very outset. So let's solve these. Again, please focus on solving these questions because I will not be able to answer general questions during during the question answer, during the problem solving part, I'll surely address questions at the end of it. So we intend to spend about 60 to 70 minutes on these problems and then another 20 question, uh, another 20, 30 minutes on general Q and A. So there is a question from Govind. Govind, uh, in case there is any issue with your registration, just call us on the phone numbers listed on the website so that it can be resolved quickly. Please think about this. This is more of a slightly real worldish problem. Yeah, think of any general bank accounts that you may have opened or that you know of. Just please read the options carefully. I see some of you who are in a hurry to answer this question, making silly mistakes. This is a literally one mark giveaway. This is... I would call it very easy question, right? So Gates, Gate might just call it easy, but this is a very, very easy question. I see a lot of you are making a mistake. Just think how bank accounts work in most banks in India. I mean, I've seen at least 20, 30 of you putting an answer which doesn't make sense. So you have a person, you have an account and you have a bank account relation. Oh, sorry, relationship, that's what I mean. Okay, thankfully I see some of you giving correct answers. This is a very simple question, folks. Actually, in my notes I wrote that this is a trivial question, but let's just call it very easy. Imagine you're designing the database uh, or you're drawing the ER diagram for an actual real bank like SBI or HDFC or ICICI, any of the major banks of India. Okay, I'll wait for a few more seconds and go into the solution itself. Okay, so let's let's get into this, right? So, okay, I, I'm assuming people know about basic bank accounts. That's why this question was created. But let's let's go into the details of it, right? So one person can have one account, right? That's allowed in most banks. So you can have one is to one also, right? 
One person can have one bank account. That's perfectly valid. One too many. One person can have multiple bank accounts, right? That's also possible because uh, I have a personal bank account as well as I have a corporate bank account because uh, my company's bank account is also, I, I'm one of the people on my company's bank account, right? Similarly, I can have uh, I can I can have one account of my own. I can have a joint account with my spouse, right? So one person can have can be part of multiple accounts. So this is also valid. Similarly, many to one, many people can have one account also. Imagine you have a joint account, right? Typically between parents, like I have a joint account with my father, right? In, in SBI, so multiple people can jointly have one account. I don't have a single account of my own with SBI, but I have many to one account because um, I have a joint account with my parent, right? You can also have many to many accounts. So for example, imagine th this relationship is also perfectly all right because look at this, look at a world like this, right? So if you think about these two sets, persons and accounts, just think about it from set theoretic perspective, right? Imagine there is one person here. I mean, let's just take this, right? So imagine there are, the, the, there are a father and son, right? They both can have a joint account, right? And so if you think about it, this person, so many to one is possible, many to many is also possible. So for example, you could have an account like this, right? So many to many is also possible because if, if you think about it logically, uh, one person can have a joint account with, with another person and he could have joint accounts with other people. He could have individual accounts. All those possibilities are available in most, most modern banking, right? So uh, again, this question was given more from a real world perspective, right? Of course, if this sort of question is given in a gate thing, I mean, common sense that people know that joint accounts are always there in modern banking, right? Everybody should know that Typically, you will have some form of, I mean, joint accounts. I mean, probably, yeah, in a gate question, probably they want to be more rigorous and they say, hey, joint accounts are, uh, are, are allowed for, right? They might say that. So this question was given mostly from a real world perspective, right? So, of course, there are some assumptions or basic understanding of basic banking that is expected here. But uh, this question was primarily given just to test if you can map a real world problem into what type of relationship it could be. Right? So four, all four are possible. So A, B, C, D is the most appropriate answer. Right? Imagine if a question like this is given, most likely in gate, they will also mention that joint accounts are, are available and they are, they're allowed in this system. But that's, that's like common sense, at least. I mean, most people know that, right? That joint accounts do exist. Okay, cool. Sounds good. So simple real world problem. Let's get into other sorts of problems. Okay, here is a second question. Again, I had to compress everything into one page. That's why I had to squeeze everything. So you have two relations, X and Y, or two tables X and Y. Some operation has been performed to obtain Z. What would that operation be? And please understand that this is an MSQ. So for the previous question, if you do not understand how basic banking works, that's okay. Don't worry. That's perfectly okay. Yeah, in this question, there is no knowledge gap uh, as one of the students put in the chat window. So you can just tackle this right away. Please think through carefully. Don't be in a hurry. This is a typical one mark question. Again, we're starting with easier questions, right? Yeah. 
Yes, in Z there are six columns, X dot A, X dot B, X dot C, Y dot A, Y dot C, Y dot D. There are six columns, like I've written it in a column separated values, just to save on space because I could not put everything in one screen. Again, please understand that multiple options here could be correct because it's an MSQ, which means one or more options can be correct. So please be careful with that. There's a fairly easy question about relational algebra. Okay, good, good, good. I think most of you got it right. Very simple, straightforward problem here. I'll wait for a few seconds for everyone to finish. Okay, cool, let's solve this, right? So what are we doing? We're doing a simple cross product followed by a, a selection, right? We're we're, uh, so we're going to just apply this predicate, right? Or this Boolean expression on top of the cross product. It's, the, it's just that simple. So, okay, let's look at this. X dot B greater than equals to Y dot D. So these are X dot Bs, these are Y dot Ds, right? So if you have this predicate that x dot b should be greater than or equal to y dot d, then this should join with this, this should join with this, and this should join with this. Because 5 is greater than or equal to 3, 3, and 4. Yes. So in the resultant table, you should have 2, 5b along with 5b3, 6d3, and 7c4, but you don't see that. Right? So obviously, 1 cannot be the correct answer. Right? Simple. So you can just eliminate one. What about two? So what does two say? Two says y dot b, sorry, x dot b, this part, is less than equal to y dot d. So if you do that, look at this, less than equal to, right? It's a less than equal to. So this, this, this will satisfy with, uh, with all three of them. So one three a will join with all the three rows. That's what we see here, right? One three a will join with all three of them because three is less than equal to three, three is less than three. 3 is less than or equal to 4, right? So simple. Now, similarly, what about 2, 5? Let's look at 5 now. This 5 is greater than all of them. So 2, 5b will not join with anything and that's what we have in the result. What about this? We have 2 here. 2 is less than or equal to 3 and 4. So 2, 3, 2b will also join with all these 3 rows, right? So perfectly all right. That's what we see in the result. So obviously, A cannot be the right answer. B is a right answer. But you have to be careful because it's an MSQ. Other options also could be correct. Okay. Now let's look at the third one. What does it say? X dot A is greater than or equal to Y dot A. Now if you see this, X dot A, these values are all less than equal to these. Because this is 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7. So if you join, right? So X dot A can never be greater than or equal to Y dot A's. So this will result in an empty tuple. So this can't be the answer. Very simple. Now let's look at the fourth option. Very simple. This is all about knowing what is happening here. You're doing a cross product and then applying this Boolean predicate. That's all you're doing. If you know how this works, this is a straightforward problem. So the fourth one is x dot c equals to y dot c. So what happens here? The, the a, so 1, 3, a will not match with anything because a does not exist here. But in the resultant table, we have 1, 3, a matching with 5, b, 3. Right? So this, this is not possible if, if you have this equality predicate. So this also can't be the answer. So only 2 is the right answer. Simple. It takes literally 1 minute or so to answer this. Very simple, straightforward, literally one mark giveaway type of question. Right? 
Again, there are multiple ways to solve this question. I'm not denying it. So some of you might say, hey, I will look at Z and C and map it. There are, I mean, there is no only one right way to often solve. So somebody might say, hey, I will look at this. Is X dot B greater than or equal to Y dot D everywhere? No, which means this should be incorrect. That's another way to solve it, right? There are, there are two ways of solving it. Either of it, you can arrive from the resultant and then check for each of these expressions or you can start this expression and say, hey, what would be the resultant of this expression and see if that resultant is equal to Z. Both are valid approaches, right? Cool. Okay, so here is another question. Please read this question carefully. It's a slightly lengthy question to read, but easy to solve. Please read the question carefully here. If you just know these concepts, it's fairly simple to solve. I see some of you already making mistakes with this. This is a simple question. This is this is somewhere between easy to medium, but uh, it's a fairly simple question, folks. I see a lot of you making a mistake already, surprisingly. Let me give you a hint for those of you who made a mistake. Draw the set theory diagram. Draw the set diagram. Again, this is what we focus a lot when we learn relational algebra in our videos, right? Because it's easier to think from a set theoretic perspective. So think from a set theoretic perspective or set diagrams. How do you represent sets diagrammatically? Diagrams are a great strategy to help you get clarity. I think for most of, uh, most of these concepts in the course videos, we actually draw tons of set diagrams to help you understand the concepts. That way you'll also make fewer mistakes. For a lot of relational algebra and ER diagrams, the set diagrammatic approach is a, is a golden thing. It's something I learned as a student. I used it extensively. And I, we also try to teach the same in our course videos with the help of our mentors. I see some of you correcting your answers. Good, good, good. I'll wait for a few more seconds before I go into the solution. The last two questions of this paper are more interesting or the first three are easier, but the last two are more interesting to solve. 
we'll spend considerable time on question four and five actually. They're not hard, but they're interesting. Cool, so let's actually solve this, right? So you have A, B, C, D, right? You have these four elements in set A. In set B, you have W, X, Y, Z, right? Or Z. So now let's look at what we have in this relation, right? So there's a relation between both of them, A, W. So A, W, A, X, right? Then C, Y, cool. Uh, C, Z, nice. And D, Z, where is D, Z, D, Z. So if you observe, one element of A, so your relation is like this, right? It's from A to B. So uh, look at this, one element of set A is mapping to multiple elements of B. Similarly, one element of B is mapping to multiple elements of A. So what you have is a many to many relationship, right? Because this can map to multiple values. This is also mapping to multiple values. So what you have is a many to many. So the moment you read many to many, you can eliminate this, you can eliminate this. So you're left with only two options, right? So, so the relation from A to B is many to many. Uh, oh, so th you can eliminate this also actually. Oh, sorry, I thought this option was slightly different. Uh, hmm. Okay, so you can eliminate this also. But okay, let's, again, this question could have been made slightly trickier with MSQs. Again, somebody recommended if you can add more MSQs. We have tried to add, because MSQs are more recent, they were only introduced last year. We are trying to add as many MSQs in test series as we can. But we are also being practical and adding the number of MSQs or weightage to MSQs, very similar to what we have seen in the last year gate paper, right? So you will see some MSQs for sure. So, okay, so this is a many to many, that part is realized. Now, where A is partially participating, yes, in this relation, A, set A is only partially participating because if you observe carefully, B is not mapped to anything. That's why it's a partial participation. While B is totally participating because for every element of B, there is an inverse image here, right? So every element of B is mapped to an element of A, but every element of A is not mapped, right? This makes it partial participation. This makes it partial participation of set A because everything is mapped, this makes it total or complete participation, right? So three is the most appropriate option. Again, this question could have been twisted slightly, okay? Uh, okay, so I think there are some general questions. Okay, I'll, I'll skip that. Let's focus on this question itself. So this question could have been made, an, made into an MSQ where multiple things could have been asked. Like there could be, there could be some four statements some statements about the type of relationship being many to many or one to one, some about whether something is totally participating or partially participating, right? So this question could easily be converted into an MSQ in that format, just, just giving you that heads up. Of course, when you have an MSQ like this, uh, you also might make more mistakes, but we'll try and introduce more MSQs in these live sessions also going forward. I think today we have fewer of them. Okay, so please, uh, Again, I could not compress everything in one page. I tried my best to squeeze in everything. And uh, look at this. So you have an ER diagram. Please read this question. These are actually, so, okay. So you know this, so figure it out. If you have any questions, let me know about this, uh, about this question itself. Okay, I'm just seeing this on my phone and seeing if everything is visible on the phone. Yeah, so if I make it full screen, I can see it. If anything is not visible, please let me know in the chat window. I will surely uh, elaborate on it. This is a good two mark question. If I'm not wrong, uh, this question has been created from scratch by one of our mentors. This is not a modification of a question in a textbook or anything. I think this was created from scratch. If nothing is mentioned, you should assume that it's MCQ. Oh, sure, uh, Sadiq will provide more time for this. I know this problem takes more time, so I will give you more time. This is a medium level question. 
So I went through the earlier questions little quickly because they're easier. For problems like these, I'll surely give you more time. Even the next question is slightly lengthier like this. Please be very, very careful. So all of these problem solving live sessions happen from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Typically on Tuesdays and Fridays. Some of them are public, some of them are private only to our course enrolled students. Okay, somebody says I do not understand the options. So imagine this is your ER diagram. You are converting this ER diagram into tables or relations with the objective of minimizing the number of resultant tables. Can such a table exist in that minimized set of tables? Can such a table exist in the minimized set of tables? Given this ER diagram with one to many participations, with partial participation, all of that stuff. Right? So which of these tables can be part of the resultant set of tables that you'll get when you minimize the number of tables, when you convert this ER diagram to tables? That's the question. Again, we've explained this in lots of detail in the course videos on how to minimize the number of resultant tables given any type of ER diagram and how that works internally. We try to prove all that from a set theoretic perspective. Those are some of the most interesting videos I've done in databases. Because I could prove it very easily on why that is optimal strategy using simple concepts in set theory. Please be very, very careful. I see almost all the four options being picked by students. Please think from first principles. Think how you would convert this ER diagram into minimum set of tables. And would any of these tables exist in that minimum set? If so, which one? If not, then obviously answer is none of the above, right? Take your time. Don't be in a hurry. I see a lot of incorrect answers. So please take your time. I expect people who are answered incorrectly and not confident of their answer to cross check. I see a lot of incorrect options here. So please revisit your answer. Again, there are two ways of solving it. I'll explain both of them, actually. Uh, Abhishek or Abhi, please feel free to ask us the general questions at the end of it. I'll be happy to answer. But in short, yes, we still have about six months for the gate examination. You can start your preparation of, be serious about it and still crack gate. There are many ways to answer this. I see some very smart answers from students also with justification. I'll, I'll try and approach this problem from two angles. 
I'll also talk about variations of this problem, how it can be made slightly more interesting or trickier. Okay, so let me solve it for you, right? So if you see this, x1 is a primary key, y1 is a primary key, z1 is a primary key. This is a one-to-many relation, right? Similarly, this is a one-to-many relation and this is a many-to-many, -many, right? It's a many-to-many. -many. And everything is partial participation. There is no total participation. Introducing total participation would have made this problem more interesting. So one way to solve this problem is you, you start from this and you start writing the minimum set of all resultant tables, right? So look at this, you have x here, so you can create one table with just x1 and x2, with x1 being the primary key, right? So if you, again, we have discussed how to convert an ER diagram or various relationships, whether it's one to many, partial, total, we have discussed about how to convert them to tables in our course videos, right? I will not be able to repeat the proof of it or the logic behind it. So because, first let's look at this. It's a one to many, so I'll just create this table. Next, in table Y, what I'll do here is, I will obviously have Y1 and Y2, Y1 being the primary key. And because this is many to one, I will have X1 as a foreign key. I'll just write FK here for foreign key, right? That, that That's a cool strategy for me to work with. Similarly, if you see, this is also a many to one relation. So I will also introduce Z1 here as a foreign key. They'll not be primary keys, they'll be foreign keys. The primary key will still be Y1. So corresponding to this, I will create this. Corresponding to this, I will create this. Now let's look at Z itself, right? So for Z, I'll simply do, because there is a one, this is a one to many and this is a many to many relationship. I will just create Z1 and Z2 and I'll have this. And I'll have one relation because this is a many to many relation. I will just have XZ. I will have X1, uh, sorry, X1, Z1 here. I will have x1, z1. These are the four resultant tables that I will get if I just apply the basic principles on how to minimize this ER diagram. If I just try to minimize this ER diagram, this is the resultant that I will get. Again, why we are doing this? Again, I will not be able to explain it because I think uh, in the course videos, I spend about half an hour, 40 minutes just explaining why we do it for various cases. Okay, so with this, if you observe, none of these are there in the, none of these, none of these options are there here. So directly you can say none of the above is the right answer. That's one way of solving. The another way of solving this is, okay, let's look at each of these tables. Okay, let me change the colors a little. Uh, okay, let's use this color. So let's look at, again, this is one way of solving it. The another way would be, let's look at this. So if you see this, your y, your x1 has a null. That makes no sense at all. If you're creating a table corresponding to this entity x trying to capture some of the relation, x1 being null makes no sense at all, right? Again, here your y1 is a primary key and it's also null, right? So it makes no sense in, in, the, in, in the possibility that you have a null value on this, right? So that, that, with that you can, you can just eliminate this option. Now, if you think about the second option, if you see for the relation corresponding to y, what should you have? Again, from this simple logic, look at this many to one relation here, right? you should have x1 as a foreign key, not as a primary key. This should be a foreign key, first of all. It cannot be a primary key. Similarly, your y is also participating in the many to one relation here. So z1 should be there as a foreign key, which is not there here. So this also can't be the answer. Now let's look at this option, right? So this is this is a table corresponding to z. Now if you observe z itself, right? z is on the one to many relationship with y and many to many with x. So why would you have x1 and y1 as part of the primary keys, right? Only z1 should be the primary key, other should not be the case, right? Because this is a many to many relationship. This is a one to many with one on the side of z. So why would you have y1 here? Makes no sense at all. So this is also incorrect. So there are two ways of solving it. Start from this, write down the minimal set of tables and what are all the primary keys there? What all are foreign keys? And you can compare them and see that none of them match. So the answer is incorrect or you can start from each of these tables and work and see if they make sense or not, right? Very simple. So again, there are many ways of solving it. I saw a very nice comment from one of the students who said, uh, hey, if you notice, all of them have all the primary keys, right? So all primary keys are here, all primary keys here, all primary keys are here. That makes no sense. All the primary keys that are there here, X1, X, Y1 and Z1, all of them are there in all the tables. 
That makes no sense. I've never seen a decomposition like this, or I've never seen a translation from ER diagram to tables like this. So none of the above must be the most logical choice. But again, the question can be tricked. So you have to be extra careful to make sure, like the way I would ideally solve is, I would solve either of the two approaches. Look at this, try to write the set of all the solutions and see which of them match, that's one. Or verify and try to eliminate options here, right? So again, this question could have been an MSQ also. Please understand, it could have been an MSQ where, uh, uh, where again, this table could be there, this table may not be there, this table could be there, this table may not be there. So only some tables which are here. Again, this question is very easy to convert to MSQ. When we have an MSQ like setup, again, you can solve, I mean, I like solving from ER diagram to this and then verifying, but you can also come the other way around. This question is literally testing your knowledge, basic knowledge of how do you go from an ER diagram to the tables or to the relational structure. That's all it's testing. Again, there could be more twists here. Imagine if you have some full participation somewhere or because everything is partial participation here, right? Imagine if some of these are full participations, then the game changes. Right? So in a question like this, if this was formulated as an MSQ in one question, they could test everything in one shot. But the reason why we did not give it as an MSQ is then it would become much, much harder. Okay, We wanted to have it the same hardness as gate. So that's why it is a two marks gate level question, medium hardness. If you make it an MSQ with more, with more additional stuff like total participations, etc., that would become closer to a harder problem by gate standards. That's why we didn't make it a full MSQ here. Cool, very nice. So let's go to the next question. Please read this question very, very carefully. This is also a nice question. Take your time, read it very carefully. Just in case you want clarity, this is pi. This is a projection operation. Just in case that is not clear. Again, if somebody thinks for the previous question, the minimum table should be five, please write down your solution with explanation and email us. In case we have made a mistake, we'll surely correct ourselves. Again, you have to read this very, very carefully. This is a nice question. This is a good two mark question again. This is all about your understanding of relational algebra. Don't be in a hurry, please take your time, read the statements very carefully. Please don't be in a hurry. Jatin, you're right. I think in the course videos, we derived uh, some of these uh, relational algebra expressions and mapped them to various joints. Yes, I remember that. Again, please cross check your answers.
this is a typical medium level problem by gate standard. This could be made little harder by ha making it an MSQ with instead of two options giving four options. That will make it little more time taking also. So we avoid an MSQ here because we didn't want to make this on the harder side. In most, again, null is treated very differently in different databases, but you cannot compare nulls. That's a simple logic, just like the way you can't uh, compare infinities, right? So that's a simple logic that you should remember, and it is respected by most database implementations. You cannot compare nulls. Take your time, take your time. Again, in relation in um, in SQL, you have E is null, right? Typically, that's what somebody is asking. In relational algebra, while people have hacked it to add some of these concepts, typically you have the equal to. And remember that null is not equals to null, right? So that's a simple logic because. Okay. Anyway, let let me just skip that. So you can't compare nulls. Okay, that's the simplest logic that you can keep in mind. Again, nulls are treated differently by different implementations of databases. Those are the trickiest ones and hardest ones to read about. Again, what some of you are talking about string comparisons that depends on the database that implements it. Okay, I'll wait for your answers instead of confusing you more with nulls. Okay, I think we have spent a good amount of time on this. So let's go into the solution, right? So what does this say? You're given two relations R and S and we are performing a natural join, right? So natural join basically means whatever are the common columns, we will do an equality check. That's what the predicate is, right? So typically you have this predicate, right? R into S and this predicate is typically the equality on the common columns, right? So consider two tuples, you have these two tuples having a null value in the common attribute, whatever that common attribute is, right? If it has a null value, then those tuples that do not match, look at this, there is a double negation here. Those tuples that do not match, they're not matching and nulls don't match because a null, again, the reason nulls don't match logically is because the null, which means the data is, there is no data there, could be because of various reasons. That's why typically most databases say, Hey, null is not equal to null. So how does this work? So this predicate, again, what we're doing here is a natural join, which is basically cross product followed by applying a Boolean predicate. This predicate is basically an equality predicate on the common columns because it's a natural join, right? So now what does it say? Those tuples that do not match, okay, they do not match. Again, they do not match probably because nulls don't match with nulls or because they genuinely don't match because one tuple could have a different value from the other value. They're not present in the resultant relation. Perfect. If they don't match, 
they will not be there in the resultant relation because what happens when, when you do this predicate when you apply this predicate some people write it as p some people write it as theta whatever it is right so this predicate says first do the cross product and then apply the equality whenever it is true only then add it to the resultant if it is false or null if it is false or null don't add it right so if there are tuples which have null in the common column null is not equal to null so those certainly will not match and they will not be present in the resultant relation so this statement is surely correct now let's look at the second statement again this is something that we've already discussed in the course videos so it might be easier for some of you so what we have is a left outer join with some theta theta is basically the predicate here right some condition on the join it's not a it's not a natural join it's some predicate or we typically write it as p or theta here so it's theta left outer join between two relations now look at this let's break this down what is this doing this is basically doing a simple join it's doing a join look at this what is it doing it, it basically does this right it basically does r r cross s it does a cross product and then whatever this predicate is right whatever this predicate theta is it will give all the results so this is like a regular join based on a condition now what about this so again there is a union in a left outer join what do you have if you have this table as r this table as s whatever is matching whatever is the theta that you have whatever is a predicate whatever matches you will have that but whatever do not match also you will have nulls from this from this again because you're doing a left outer join right it's a left outer join so whatever suppose there is a row here there is a row here that does not match so you will place that row with nulls with respect to the s number with respect to whatever number of columns are there in s so this part tells us whenever there is a join whenever the join is there yes but whenever the join is not there you still have to account for those that's why there is this union so you have a union now what is this doing again a small twist here could could make you fall into a trap right so you have to read this very carefully so what is this doing here it is saying hey first i will do this join right i'll just do this join with the predicate from that i will project all the rows that are there in r i will subtract the, those rows from r which means whatever already joined suppose imagine this row joined this row joined this row joined whatever rows that are joined i will remove them so what am i left with i'm left with these rows which did not join right that's that's what that's what this this expression is saying whatever whatever rows that did not already join because you're doing a set subtraction here right whatever joined you get this you're doing a projection from that and then you're saying remove it from r so this will result in all the rows that did not join you do a cross product with all nulls right then what would this give you this will so this is giving you all the rows which which join perfectly this will give you all the rows that did not join with nulls of course the implicit assumption here is the number of nulls here is same as the number of columns of s that's the implicit assumption right very simple right so this is what left outer join is and that's why 2 is also correct the catch here is let me give you a couple of variations of this this question could have been converted into slightly more trickier by messing up this slightly instead of minus they could have given union right very easy to fall into the trap if you are not careful if you don't know how to read these expressions you will make mistakes the strategy that i recommend uh, again some of the course participants already know it is always try to break it and understand what this is doing break it down break it down into smaller parts break this down into smaller parts and then understand what will be the resultant of this break it down and work backwards think of it like a like a top down approach right or you can some people might call it bottom up bottom up approach also where you are solving smaller problems combining smaller problems to get solve the larger problem right so this could have been made slightly trickier by changing and playing around with this that's one another thing is this could have been converted into an msq very easily by instead of two exp two two statements here they could have given four statements and said which of the following statements are correct we avoided that because that would become slightly lengthy right except that this is just the same thing uh so some people are saying the second statement is confusing intentionally it is it is intentionally it is made so again in our course videos by the way we discuss how you can represent things like left outer joins using these sort of uh, uh relational algebraic i almost said boolean algebraic these relational algebraic expressions right so you have to be careful you have to understand this because this is a very very nice format of questions that could come 
okay so with that with that done let me just uh, let me just change screens a little quickly and uh, let me answer general questions that some of you have asked right so feel free to post your questions i have them on the phone i will try to answer as many as possible in the next uh, 20 or so minutes Uh, so how good is triple IIT Hyderabad curriculum as compared to old IITs? As compared to most other IITs, I think triple IIT Hyderabad is better uh, in terms of course curriculum because it's very, very, uh, it's, it's probably the most industry centric curriculum I have seen amongst all the top universities of India as far as master's degree is concerned. Even their undergraduate degree because I've hired from triple IIT Hyderabad earlier, their I think uh, they have very nice industry focus in their education, not just theory. So I would rate Triple IIT Hyderabad's course curriculum literally at the top or at least one of the top because I've not seen all the universities curriculum, but it is certainly one of the top. It's, it's um, I mean, I would say it's closer to some of the world's top universities. Forget about old IITs. It's actually closer to some of the tops, some of the world's top universities in terms of their, uh, in terms of their industry focus. Okay, so uh, another question. This, uh, this is a very often asked question in the, in the live sessions. Stepwise method for revision, very simple. I'll, I'll keep it short because I've answered this almost in every live session. Weekly, whatever you're learning, revise. Monthly, whatever you're learning, revise. Every two to three months, everything you're learning, revise. First, finish all the subjects. Revision through problem solving is very, very helpful. Once you finish all the subjects or at least 90% of the subjects, go solve grand tests, solve subject tests, solve multi-subject tests. Again, in your second revision, revise the whole, suppose if you're taking a multi-subject test, right? So go through all the subjects, take the test, debug your mistakes, go back, revise, keep doing it. In the, so first revision, first iteration is monthly, weekly, quarterly revision. Second iteration is revision through problem solving. Revise first, revise all your notes, solve the problems, debug your mistakes. Third iteration, typically, which is last one month or maybe last even 20 days or last 15 days before the exam, revise all your notes, revise all your mistakes, calm down, cool down, go for the exam. Simple. I mean, if you have to summarize everything in like one, two minutes, this is what it would be. Yes, so Nimesh asks, is there a three-year master's program at some of the institutes? Yes, so there is something called as MS by research. It's also sometimes referred to as MTech by research. Those programs typically tend to be two to three years. Some students finish in, in two years, some students finish in two and a half years, some students do it in three years. So in MTech by research, typically, not always, typically there is lesser course work that you have to complete and more research work that you have to participate in. So you typically become a research assistant instead of a teaching assistant at most universities. And the objective is you have done considerable amount of research and in terms of placements, there is not going to be much of a difference between a two-year or a three-year program candidate. But if you're looking for a PhD program and you want to experience research, doing an MTech by research or MS by research is a good idea because it will give you a flavor of research if you're not sure, right? And of course, if you don't want to go for a PhD, you can always go into the job market. Uh, Again, somebody is asking, what about placements at IITs and IASC for MTech? I was just talking to the chairman of the department at IASC recently because we conduct summer boot camps for both the computer science and the non-computer science departments. The last year batch, the batch that, that, that just graduated. Again, uh, I think uh, I forgot the numbers a little. I think the overall package for MTech graduating students, the overall, everybody got placed. This is at IASC. The, for the batch who just graduated, literally at the peak of the pandemic, they graduated in the worst possible situation. I think their median CTC or average CTC is about 24 or 24 and a half lakhs. And for MTech in AA candidates, I think it, it was 27 lakhs. Because I was just discussing with, 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 uh, with the chairman. Again, the, I know him because he was my professor and mentor at IASC and I work very closely with him, a great mentor of mine, Professor Chiranjip. And in one of the discussions that I was having with the... Uh, the students who just graduated uh, during our boot camp sessions, uh, they said these are the compensations that we got because we also conducted boot camp for them because they were a little uh, not sure about how placements would pan out for them. So you can say other IITs are also roughly in the same ballpark range, maybe slightly less 
some maybe around that range, right? So the market is not a problem. Again, when I talk to my friends who are in the industry, most of them principal engineers or senior managers, etc., they say they're struggling to hire good candidates and they want to hire good candidates, right? So, I mean, I think placements is not an issue as long as you have the right skills. Uh, is there still enough time to get an AR less than 100? I think yes. We have had we have seen students last year who have started literally in the last six months and cracked gate. Uh, of course, they also put in enormous amount of effort in the sense that they were putting in like on an average five hours a day with dedicated effort. We saw their progress actually. And we said these guys are really, really dedicated. They struggled in the first mock tests and grand tests, but they certainly went through that cycle of ups and downs. By the time they were in late Jan, early Feb, they were doing phenomenally well and they got good ranks, by the way, right? So six months, I often tell this, if you're putting in six to seven months, four to five hours a day for an average student, dedicated effort, focused effort, you can crack gate. It's, 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 it's literally that. Cool. Uh, so Rahul says, I got 1600 rank in gate 2021. What do you suggest? Rahul, uh, please reach out to us on the phone uh, that we have uh, at Applied AA course because we can suggest only based on what your exact priorities are and what universities you're getting admissions with the 1600 rank. So just call on the phone number that we have at uh, gate.appliedroots.com. One of our mentors or one of our co-founders can give you more, more clean answer than a generic answer that I can give you. A uh, very nice question. What defines a good candidate for companies? Very nice. See, for a, from a fresh master's degree student or a bachelor's degree student, the expectation is quite low, to be honest with you. Because I know the expectation from more experienced folks, the expectation is very, very high there. For a fresh candidate, if you're looking for software developer roles, very simple. Can you code well? Do you know data structures? Do you know algorithms? Do you have depth of knowledge at least in one area of computer science? Because you're a master's degree student, simple. If you're looking for AI roles, in addition to all the basic understanding of data structures algorithms, your depth, breadth, and applicative knowledge of AI and machine learning would be tested. That's all is expected. Again, to be honest with you, that's all is expected. And uh, even that becomes a challenge to hire because I've been through so many interview loops at, at some of the fan companies. Yeah, so the expectation is quite low, to be honest with you. And if you compare that with folks with two years or five years experience, the expectation is like at least 5x more. Uh, somebody is asking about the Mastery Go platform. So Akash, uh, just let us know what problems you're facing because uh, in the Mastery Go platform for Gate itself, it's fairly straightforward and simple. Uh, we use the same platform for various tests that we conduct uh, for our diploma program that we do with some universities. So it's a generic platform that we build for a lot of our programs. For Gate, it's, it's a much more simpler implementation of the same core thing. Any problems you face, just let us know. We'll just email us or else. I'll be, we'll be able to explain that and uh, help you resolve. But the UI is fairly close to what you would see, Not maybe not exactly the same, but close to what you will encounter in a typical uh, gate examination, in a computer-based test. So the question here is, I've completed C, D, S, C, N maths. Very nice, very good. So now can I, can I now complete everything else? Yes, we have what? We are in August 10th. September, October, November, December, Jan, Feb. You have exactly six months, maybe a few days here and there. Very good. You have completed some of the larger subjects. Very good. So you can, even if you're starting today, try and put in that four to five hours a day. If you're an average student, you can crack it. No worries about it. Just prioritize subjects that you can score more marks in, like TOC, CD, DLD, etc. That's it. That's the core idea there. Uh, Yes, so Laksh says uh, uh, there might be, again, some of the concepts, there is an overlap between computer organization and operating systems. Because at the end of the day, the operating system is literally sitting on top of the raw hardware itself, right? It's, it has to leverage the computer's internal organization of memory, the processors and things like that. So there are always overlaps between things. Sometimes you might say, hey, is this question properly CO question or OS question? Because there is some overlap there. And whatever is the more more important question or whatever, when you solve the question, whichever concepts are more important, we try to put it in that bucket. So there will always be overlaps of questions. For example, look at uh, graph theory in, uh, so graph theory comes in uh, both discrete mathematics and graph algorithms are there in data structures and algorithms. And some amount of little bit of graph theory is also there in computer networks. 
So there are always these overlaps because computer science is not like every field is independent of other. Right? Similarly, look at probability theory. You have combinatorics questions that are there in aptitude. They're also there in uh, probability and uh, you don't have statistics, but you have probability in gate. Right? So there are always these overlaps and things like that. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is from when can we give test series? So my suggestion is as follows. This is uh, Barot. Uh, my suggestion is this. The full length tests, the grand tests, mock tests, you can give it once you finish the first iteration. That's what we recommend. Please use them for your second iteration. In the first iteration, the moment you finish any topic or any subject, start taking the test series. If you're a course enrolled student, you have two test series, last year's and this year's. Take both of them. Like every week, right, as part of your weekly revision, you can take the questions from the test series for that topic or for that subject. And once you finish, again, try and mix problem solving with revision. So for example, suppose you, you finished a bunch of topics in a given week, take the topic test from the test series. Simple as that, along with the practice tests. You already have practice tests. In addition to that, take the topic tests from the test series, right? Once you finish, let's say, whole subject, right? You can always take uh, subject tests from the test series. Once you finish two to three subject, take multi-subject tests. The grand tests and the full length tests, you should try and take them once you finish all the subjects or at least most of the subjects. Okay, that's what we recommend. Again, somebody's uh, Rishu is asking how to tackle those overlap questions. They're, they typically are not very hard. If you know the concepts in these subjects, they're more or less straightforward, right? So there, there are these overlaps, but they're fairly, fairly straightforward. Okay, very nice question from Parag, which is how similar are data structures and algorithms in gate as compared to interviews? It depends on what company you're interviewing for. If you're looking at the top fang-like companies, Amazon's, Google's of the world, their interview questions are much, much harder than what you see in gate. It's as simple as that. Gate, that's why I often say gate questions are easy because they are, okay? Even in the fang companies, they typically ask medium level questions. They don't ask very hard questions. So gate questions as compared to a FANG company interview are easier. Let's be realistic about it. Let's be truthful about it, number one. And FANG companies are testing different skills. They are testing, can you execute, can you write executable code in about 20 minutes to 30 minutes for a given problem? That's their objective. Gate doesn't have coding, which is unfortunate, right? So gate only checks, do you know this concept? For example, take a dynamic programming problem, right? In a typical interview, it's very easy to ask that because I can give you a real world problem that maps to a DP and I'm expecting you to write a bottom up DP typically. Right? Of course, you can write a top down also. There are some disadvantages with it, but I'm, I can ask that question. In a gate question, that's much easy, much harder to ask that, right? And I can test a lot of skills with that single question. And in gate, you have, you have roughly about two and a half, three minutes, even for a, maybe four minutes for a slightly harder question. There you have 20, 25 minutes, right? Similarly, if I, if, I, if I want to create a question wherein you have to use graph traversals, I can't do it very efficiently in the gate system, right? I wish gate also introduces some programming questions. I, I really wish they do. But the data structures and algorithms in FANG-like companies are surely harder. Uh, and they're testing for slightly different skills than, uh, than what you have in gate. But if you're strong in gate knowledge, doing that will be easier for sure, right? Because gate is a strong foundation at the end of the day. So, okay. How to understand if you're doing over revision or attempting too many tests in one particular subject? Very nice question from Shreya. So my suggestion is this. Uh, one way you can do it is plan backwards. You can say, hey, I want to have last three weeks for my last revision. I want to have these many days or these many weeks for my second revision. Now, break down the rest of the time and say, hey, in this week or in these two weeks, or in these three weeks, I have to finish this subject. Try and work backwards from the deadline because you have an exam deadline, right? Work backwards from there. Say, hey, last 50, last three weeks, I want to, you can start counting in weeks now, right? Because you have six months, right? Roughly about, uh, again, I have to be, I have to cross check, but um, 26 weeks, right? There are 52 weeks in a year. So roughly about 26 weeks, give or take one week here. So maybe break it down into weeks and then say, hey, am I overspending time? That's a better way to work out because now you're chunking your time with the deadline in mind. Okay, standard process that um, many students do, also many companies do with which have deadlines. 
Cool. Uh, likelihood of two sets this year, we don't know. It all depends on the pandemic situation. Uh, it all de depends on uh, whether uh, folks are vaccinated enough. It depends on a lot of parameters. Let's just prepare for the worst case and assume that there are multiple sets. Right? We don't know that. Last year, I think one of the fundamental reasons why multiple sets were there last year, because social distancing norms, we do, they didn't want students to fall sick, who attend the examination, all those norms kick in. So this is uh, Krishna who says, I'm completing the syllabus November end and simultaneously PYQs and test series by December end. Perfect. Very good. If you can, if you can st stick to that plan, very, very good. You just have extra time in uh, Jan and Feb. Like there is nothing that says you should do only three, three iterations. You can do the fourth iteration if you have time, right? But please solve the problems rigorously. Try and put an extra effort to improve your problem solving skills. There is a video on our channel. You can check that out. Are MSQs here to stay? I wish they stay forever. I really like them. And I think they are a better model in general. Because uh, the reason being, in an MCQ, you can eliminate. So even if you have partial knowledge, you might be able to score marks in MCQs. Of course, there is a negative marking. I understand that. But MSQs can be designed in such a way that they can test your, your, your depth of knowledge and breadth of knowledge in a single question. Okay, I wish they stay for a longer time. Of course, if more questions become MSQs, probably the number of questions should decrease. Because MSQs typically take more time to solve than typical MSQs, typically. Right? So I think MSQs are here to say stay and I think it's, 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 it's a decision in the good direction. Do more number of candidates affect the toughness of question papers? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so to be honest with you. Uh, um, I don't think so because at the end of the day it's a relative marking, right? It's not absolute marking. So why should they care about uh, whether the question paper is easy or hard? Okay, so there is a question here about what extra should I do for uh, TCS and other companies? So fundamentally, even for services companies or good roles in TCS, TCS digital, etc. Uh, the knowledge of data structures and algorithms that you have for Gate is very good. In addition to that, please practice programming. Because all of these companies have some form of programming around us. And if you're comfortable with C data structures, algorithms that are there in the Gate syllabus, of course, the only difference between TCS Digital and let's say Amazon or Google is the hardness of questions. The concepts are more or less the same. It is just the hardness of questions which change. Right? At the end of the day, that, that's the bottom line. So my suggestion here is the ability to program is very, very helpful. I've also, uh, I mean, we've also done a video recently and put it on our YouTube channel, which talks about writing some code as much as possible, especially when you're learning C programming, data structures, algorithms, because that's a fundamental skill that every computer science graduate or anybody who studied computer science should have. Unfortunately, it's not tested in Git. I wish it changes. Triple AAA Hyderabad has done a good job on that. Is a master's degree worth it if companies only want data structures, algorithms and coding? Very nice question, Anirudh. Uh, as far as a company is concerned, it doesn't care about a degree. Let's be, let's be brutally honest about it. They want skilled engineers. It doesn't matter whether you have a PhD, master's or a bachelor's or no college degree at all. It's as simple as that. Do you have the rigor? Do you have the skills? It's just as simple as that, except for few roles, which are like very researchy roles. And those roles are literally less than 0.1% of most companies workforce, right? If you remove those extreme cases, companies only care about skills, not your degrees. Bottom line. That's why you have people with a bachelor's degree who get hired by fan companies. I've seen people who don't have a bachelor's degree who get hired by fan companies because they have the right skills. Of course, the process would be different, right? It's not through campus placements. One of the reasons why students who are interested in campus placements join masters, this is the unfortunate reality of it, is because campus placements are easier to crack than non-campus ones. Simple bottom line. Of course, I hope students get out of this mindset that master's degree is like my placement prep. Don't think of it. Use it constructively because the master's degree, like at least when I was a student, I wanted to learn and excel in this small field called AI. And it was not a hype area then. There were literally very, there were literally handful of jobs in AI and machine learning when I was studying or when I joined in Institute of Science. I was truly passionate about this subject and I said, go to hell. I'm going to study as much math as possible because I'm at, I'm, I'm at one of the best research institutes of India. 
So why not learn as much machine learning? Of course, I will get a job. Getting a job is not a big problem. So unfortunately, most students treat their master's program as placement prep. Unfortunately, some universities also do it, which is the worst part. Okay, master's degree should like one thing. My life's great lessons from my master's program is I learnt deep, rigorous mathematical theory, and that gave me confidence to read any research paper in the world. Literally, any mathematical research paper I could pick. Maybe not understand 100% of it, but understand comfortably to be able to learn later in my life. That ability of mathematical rigor is what I learned in my masters. And whatever area you pick, you might you might pick let's say distributed systems. Become an expert. So that's why I'm saying in your masters, in addition to programming, data structures, algorithms, pick up one area, gain deep domain expertise, so that you 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 stand apart from a regular undergraduate student. That so you're between a PhD student and a bachelor's degree student, right? So gain some depth there because that is what will help you in the long run to stand out from the crowd and also to compete better with your peers. Cool. Uh, okay, so when to start preparing for the gate exam? There is no wrong time to do a good thing. I think there is some quotation like this. There is a Chinese proverb which says. There is no wrong time to start a good journey, right? See, if you're passionate about learning computer science well, doing a master's program in India, there is no wrong time. Even now is a pretty good time, to be honest with you, because we see students spending exactly six months, four to five hours a day cracking GATE. There is no wrong time. Again, GATE preparation is not like you can only take the exam once in your lifetime, right? If you can't crack it this year, learn as much as possible this year, you can always build on top of, top of it for the future years. Right? So that, that always works. Okay, folks, with that, I think uh, I've answered at least some of the questions, the more interesting ones. Whatever I could not answer, if there is a very important question that I missed out, feel free to email us. We'll try to answer as many as possible. All the very best. Thank you very much. And most importantly, stay safe. Let's not get our guard down because I think only some of you are fully vaccinated or some of you are partially vaccinated. Let's not get our guard down and behave as if we were in Jan or Feb of 2021 and mess up things again. So let's be on the safer side. Thank you very much.